my friend Sir Toasty Toast is currently hosting a shiny event called Ranch Week, where he's running a 24-7 livestream of My Pokemon Ranch that will slowly populate with any shinies found in Generations 3 or 4 during the event, including ones found by the community. Now, I'll admit, I've been getting a bit into shiny hunting lately. <gasps> 845! And while I unfortunately found this game corner Porygon a bit too early for Ranch Week, my recent string of shiny luck had me feeling confident that I could find something else to add to the ranch. One of the cool features of Pokemon Ranch is that several special interactions can happen when certain Pokemon are present, and while Toasty was busy doing radar chains for Pikachu and Sinnoh, I decided to make a start on unlocking one of the rarer interactions by taking my hunt to the Seve Islands. I've always been fond of the Seve Islands. Fire Red was my first Pokemon game, and despite Kanto being revisited again in Heart Gold, Soul Silver, and Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, these islands never made a return appearance and stayed exclusive to Generation 3. So when I finally replayed these games again a few years ago, rediscovering the Seve Islands was like a time capsule of preserved nostalgia. As a kid, the Seve Islands felt like exploring a bold new frontier. Something about these lonely, disconnected islands felt new and unexplored. Whether it was the Hermit on the Hill promising to teach my Charizard a secret, powerful move, the post-game islands populated with new Pokémon from the Johto region, or the several ancient ruins scattered around Islands 6 and 7, one of which is going to be the topic of discussion for today. In the middle of Ruin Valley on Island 6 is the Dotted Hole, a small ruin that you have to explore as part of the post-game story that unlocks trading with the other Generation 3 titles. But the ruins I want to talk about are on Island 7, the last of the main Sevi Islands and an entirely optional post-game area. The north of this island hosts the Trainer Tower, a facility designed to work with e-reader cards in the Japanese version, and the south of the island is a long canyon leading to several ruins scattered around the ocean, called the Tenobi Chambers. A common naming theme in the Pokemon franchise is the use of plants, and in the case of these seven chambers, they each have their own name seemingly made from a combination of a flower and their respective number when counted from right to left, with their collective name Tenobi being an anagram of botany. These chambers are also the only place where Unknown can be encountered in Generation 3, although first you need to solve the Tenobi Key, a room with a boulder pushing puzzle found halfway through the canyon. After that, a random assortment of unknown letters can be found in each chamber, and that's what our target is going to be. One of the events that can happen in Ranch is Unknown forming a keyboard, although only if you have all 28 of Unknown's forms. And since Unknown cannot be hunted with radar chains or the Masuda method, this means the community would have to collectively hunt all of its forms in the wild at full odds to unlock this event. Across the seven Tenobi chambers, five letters each are found in the Lip2, Dilford, Scoofib and Rixie chambers, four in the Weepeth chamber, and the letters A and Z in Monian and Viapoise respectively. These two chambers are also where the question and exclamation mark are known make their debut. Some people don't realise that these forms weren't in Generation 2, and it's also a common misconception that they were first added in Sinnoh's Salacion Ruin. These two unknown only have a 1% chance to appear, and only after going through the effort to unlock these encounters in a remote post-game area, so it's easy to see how they could be missed. In addition to the random letter distribution, the encounter rates within each chamber are also kind of strange. Some letters like P, C, N, and Y appear between 40 and 60% of the time in their respective chambers, while letters like E, K, and O are as low as 2%. Now, if you clicked on this video, then you already knew this is going to be about shiny unknown's rarity, but a low encounter rate isn't why these unknown can be considered rare shinies. After all, there are many wild Pokémon with low encounter rates. What makes these unknown interesting is that their actual direct shiny rate is different from all other Pokémon in this generation. This is a consequence of the personality value, a hidden 32-bit integer that all Pokémon have had since Generation 3. And up until Generation 6, it was used to determine various characteristics of wild Pokémon, such as their nature, which ability they have, and whether or not they are shiny. And in Generation 3, the game also uses this value to remember which of the 28 forms your unknown is supposed to be, by combining several parts of the ID, then dividing them by 28 and using the remainder. The calculation to determine whether or not a Pokémon is shiny is a bit more complicated, but in the most basic terms, it breaks down the personality value into two pieces of binary that are 16 digits long, and then along with the binary trainer ID and secret ID, it performs a calculation called an exclusive OR operation. This means taking two binary strings of equal length and combining them together to look for matching bits of ones and zeros. If there's a match, it becomes a zero, and if there isn't, it becomes a one. Once it has compared all four strings of binary, the final result is converted back to a decimal, and if the number is less than 8, the Pokémon will be a shiny. In binary, 111 is 7, and 1000 is 8, so that means the first 13 digits of the two 16-digit binary personality values have to exactly match the combination of 1s and zeros in the first 13 digits of your binary trainer ID and secret ID, as if any of these digits give an output of 1, then the returned decimal is going to be higher than 8. 
put it another way, your trainer ID and secret ID are basically predicting which sides a coin will land on if you flip it 13 times in a row, and every time you encounter a Pokemon, it flips those coins, and if it matches the prediction made by your trainer ID, you get a shiny. And as you might guess, the odds of correctly predicting a coin toss 13 times in a row is 1 in 8192. If you've ever wondered why the shiny rate is such a specific number, that's because it's 2 to the power of 13. To ensure that certain letters only spawn in certain chambers, the game has to adjust parts of the unknown's personality values when they're encountered, otherwise all 28 letters would simply appear in all of the chambers with roughly the same probability. As a result of this, the unknown that you're encountering in each chamber do not have a completely randomised personality value, which in turn skews their chance of being shiny. Based on your trainer ID and what chamber you're hunting in, this is either going to work in your favour or work against it. We can work out the exact odds of this thanks to an incredibly in-depth breakdown of these mechanics that was done on a French shiny hunting forum back in 2010. And if you want an even more complete breakdown on how all this works mathematically, I'm going to direct you towards this video by my friend Professor Rex, because I don't want to just repeat his video word for word. But the end result of all these equations is that unknown can be split into groups of four, with all of the forms in these groups having a shared shiny chance. In most cases, the odds are either increased to 1 in 6144, or decreased to 1 in 9216. But there are also a few groups that can have their odds reduced to 1 in 10240, or even 1 in 18432, more than two times rarer than a normal full odds shiny. And due to a quirk of 256 not dividing evenly into 28, there is also a chance your ID combination could give you a 1 in 5120 chance of encountering unknowns A, B, C or D. While there are countless combinations of trainer IDs and secret IDs, after all the calculations that go into determining forms and shiny status, the end result boils down to four separate combinations of shiny odds. And if you happen to know your secret ID, there's an online calculator tool which can tell you what set you have, including the shiny odds for each form of unknown, and the original forum post also includes a breakdown of your average shiny odds within each chamber based on what set of odds you have, and I'll link to both of these in the description. As for my shiny hunt, I knew my fire red file had the 1 in 6000 odds of finding the letters P, R and Q, so I hopped on a call with Sir Toasty Toes and started looking in the Dilford chamber for the first letter on his shiny ranch keyboard, while at the same time trying my luck at the game corner again in hopes of getting a Porygon 2. Well, well, well. Alright. If it isn't a British person. <laughs> yeah, there's the, the 10 Nose Pass event, the 7 Fossil Pokemon event, or 2 out of 7 on that one. 20 flower Pokemon, 20 jump luff. 28 different unknown. All the unknown, yep. Yeah. There's even the six Rotom one, which we can do now. Yeah. Because I've got unknown going on the side right now, just in case I might. Maybe that'll Haley's bear some fruit. Into a fence. Yeah. Why are you doing that, Haley? So. They don't work on Game Boy Player, but I could play them through my DS capture card. Get banned from Twitch for the world's crunchiest Shrek video. Do they actually have like some kind of copy protection for the GBA player? Yeah, j just Game Boy Player refuses to load them. It, uh. I think it just says like this me this media cannot be watched on Game Boy Player. That actually that, there's a splash screen for it. Uh. When you load them up uh, on a on a regular Game Boy, they just tell you not compatible with Game Boy <laughs> Player, and it's like okay, I wasn't. <laughs> Thanks, think, for the, thanks for the warning. You think it's just because they don't want you seeing like how actually crunchy the quality is? Or do you think there's like a genuine piracy f Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's... I'm pretty sure that's... That's a shiny J. Let's go. If, if, I, let, if I let my G in, that's 2 of 28. We're 1 14th of the way there. Yeah. Oh, man. Do I actually have luxury balls on this file? <laughs> Oh god, my, my my Pokeball selection is really bad on this. <laughs> I just realized I've only got Pokeballs, Ultra Balls, and Great Balls. Hang on, actually, I should probably... No dive balls, for shame. Yeah, well, let's start with luxury, but hang on. I could probably, I should probably dock this, actually, so I can get some better. This is in the analog pocket as well, actually. So this one's, you know, two for two on my last GBA shinies. Even though I've... Actually, yeah, yes, this is Fire Red, actually, so this is two that have been on that file. There we go, I don't was caught. 
Yeah, luckily they have a ridiculous catch rate. Yeah, I, I, I did a false swipe just in case, ready? <laughs> this Marowak. Yeah, I think false swipe plus any ball multiplier is guaranteed. And then false swipe plus status is guaranteed even without a ball multiplier. Continuing my recent streak of good luck, I happened upon the letter J, which in my case is a 1 in 9216 shiny. It might take a few ranch weeks before we have enough of these to complete the full keyboard, but if enough people work out how to hunt in the Tenobi chambers with the best odds, it might get done just a little faster. You should definitely look for question and exclamation in Sinnoh though, it's really not worth the trouble here.